You may be seated. You should be open to Ephesians chapter 6. We are going after a phrase in the scriptures that is going to lead us where we want to go in a couple of different places in uh, the pages of the word. But I want you to hear the context of it. And for many of you, it will be a very familiar context because it's the whole armor of God. It's going to be Ephesians 6. I'm going to start reading at verse 10. And I'm going to read through verse 20. So 6 verse 10, finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. And I want to say this again because we've heard this many times, but I want you to understand with me that he is saying that there is a vast strength, a divine strength that is available to human beings who are in Christ. Be strong in that kind of strength. Not just in your own human strength, in this kind of strength. Be strengthened by the Lord and by by his vast strength. Put on the full arm of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens For this reason, verse 13, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having prepared everything to take your stand. Stand, therefore, with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request, and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. And Paul says, pray also for me, that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. For this I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might be bold enough to speak about it as I should. You and I are going to camp on that phrase, the shield of faith in this lesson, the shield of faith. And one reason why it stands out to me, I've, uh, God enabled me to memorize this portion of scripture. So I say it in order to keep every word of it in place. I have to say it often. So any of my memory work has to be recited on a regular basis or I'll lose some of it. So I go through these words over and over again. And every single time I come to verse 16, I think the same thing. Listen to the promise that goes with it. In every circumstance, take off up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the fiery darts of the evil one. All of them. Now, it's a promise. He said, if you will take up the shield of faith, you will be able to. That no matter what the enemy throws at you, no matter what kind of fiery darts come your way, if you will hold up that shield of faith, you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. I just love the word all. Anybody else? I love something that speaks like a bold promise. And that is what you have in the scriptures. And that is certainly what you have in verse 16. Now, in the word of God, there are all sorts of shields. There are small round shields. There are oval shields that are a little bit uh, larger than that. But this was a very specific kind of shield, and he's making a reference to something that would have been a common sight among Roman soldiers, and it would have been a much larger shield. It would have been a shield that would have been about uh, four feet in length. So I'm right at five, four and a half, so about four feet in length, and then several feet wide, about two and a half feet wide, And it would be able to protect that whole body, especially the part of us that would be the most vulnerable. Now, we've got on the helmet, but then here, here's the armor, and then here is the shield of faith. And so it's it's large, rectangular, and it is normally wooden. It is covered in leather, and then in order to extinguish the flaming darts, it would have to be soaked in water before the battle so that when the darts hit it, they would be extinguished by the water. 
So I want you to try to even imagine how heavy that thing would be. Think with me what an exercise faith is. I kept thinking about this, that what muscle it takes to continue to walk in faith. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That it's muscle that has to be built up over time so that we can keep holding it. Because, man, it can get heavy, can it? And if we're not used to walking in faith, then, I mean, sometimes we have to be really, really, really deliberate about just like hauling that thing up off the ground, figuratively speaking, and holding it in front of us. But he said, if you do, if you do, if you will take up the shield of faith, you will be able to extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. I thought about what it would be like to be hit by those flaming arrows. And I wonder if it's like it is on the movies, like on Braveheart, when you can hear those arrows going through the air. I wonder what it's like then when you feel, if you're holding the shield, what it feels like when it hits the shield and you're trying to keep hold of yourself with the mental awareness that you are this far from a flaming arrow that has just hit your shield. I keep thinking about it because we'd be able to feel both the hit and the heat. Sometimes we feel the hit of warfare that God says is extremely real, and you can see that throughout both testaments of Scripture. But sometimes we can feel the hit but to also be able to feel the heat of it and hold that thing up and not flinch when that fire is at arm's length until it extinguishes that flame. So here's what I thought we'd do. I decided to do, this is my very, very favorite thing to do on earth, and if, if we've ever studied together, chances are we have done this together. I love to look at a particular theme and then go back and see if we can search out the history of it. Just the first mention of it. What's the first time the word shield, because we're looking into this whole idea of shield. Okay, what's the first time it appears in Scripture, and is there anything significant about it that would make it noteworthy to us by the time we get to Ephesians 6, 16. Well, indeed, there is. Would you turn with me now? I'll leave something here because we'll be coming back to it. Go with me to Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1. Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. I just never saw the day coming when my mask would be my bookmark. Anybody? <laughs> These are the strangest days we're living in. Chapter 15 of Genesis, we're going to hear the word shield for the first time. Not only are we going to hear it for the first time, but God himself is going to say it. Now, it's very noteworthy that, th that the scripture that, that God is inspiring is quoting God himself saying it. And so 15.1 says this. After these events, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, and your reward will be very great. I am your shield. I love the New King James Version of this verse so much. And I've, I've looked it up. I've, I've honestly just gotten myself forehead deep in research of this verse because I love this other rendering so much and it can be rendered either way, which is why you have it one way in one translation, another way in another. They, it could be either one, but listen to the way the New King James Version says it. And this is what I learned this verse in. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. I tried to read very, very carefully every single time God is quoted as saying something. Now, he's inspiring. All, all Scripture is God breathed. But there are times in, in, of course, the narrative of Genesis that God himself is speaking, and God said, and God said, and God said. So I tried to read carefully. So I'm not positive. I may have missed something. But if I didn't miss it, I think that I'm right in saying to you that this is the first description in the Bible quoting God describing himself. So this is God talking about who he is to Abram. 
And I love that he's going to use it in a, in a possessive way with Abram. I am your something. I am your something. And he says to him, and so this is the first, you might think of it this way, and I'm not thinking of it in the same way as we think of the gospel uh, of John and the I am statements, but this is God saying, I am to Abram. And the first time he says it, in description of himself, he says, I am your shield. I am your shield. Do not be afraid. He's going to say later in that same chapter, I am the Lord. A couple of chapters later, he's going to say, I am God Almighty. And then we know he follows suit throughout the scriptures, all the way through Revelation. He is telling us again and again who he is. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the one who is and was and is to come. The Almighty he tells us all through the scriptures who he is. And he begins right here. Abram. I am your shield. Later to Isaac, he'll be called, he'll call himself, I'm the God of Abraham. And, and then to, to Jacob, he'll say, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac. And then later on to Moses, he'll say, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I am your God. I am your God. And beautifully here. I am your shield. It says in 15.1, after these events. And so I don't know if you're like me, but because this chapter, chapter 15, is such a significant chapter in Genesis because it is where God is going to ratify the covenant with Abram. He's literally going to cut covenant with Abram and put him into a deep sleep. And so what's about to happen could not be more remarkable and have more impact throughout the entire scriptures oh, to us as, as, the, as the sons, as the, the daughters, as the children of Abraham coming from that same covenant through Christ Jesus who kept the promise that through him all nations would be blessed. So it, it just could not be more significant, chapter 15. And so I'll often turn to chapter 15, especially if I'm teaching on covenants, without going back to 14. It starts out with after these things. So what's important for you and me is to figure out what are the things that this was after. Because what you and I are going to find is that they do indeed have bearing on what he's saying as he opens up in 15. So, so let's take just a little glance. We don't have a lot of time to spend on 14. But I want to give you a little bit of an overview of it. And I'll tell you what's happening here. Uh, Genesis chapter 14 puts forth an extremely interesting juxtaposition. It has nine different kings at war and their armies. There are four kings against five kings, and their armies are all going against one another. The four kings are allied, the five kings are allied, and they're going against one another. Now, the four kings, it begins by describing the four kings at the very beginning. The four kings are kings from the east. The five kings are kings in the Jordan Valley. So this is getting close to the Dead Sea, and it's bordering right on. I mean, it is now crossing over, overlapping into what is within the perimeter of the place of promise that God has given Abraham. So it's very significant battles. But the juxtaposition is this. They're warring over here because these four kings, particularly under one, under the rule of one, these four kings have come together against some nations or peoples that have decided they're sick of being subject to them. They, they rebelled, they'd uh, come against them, and they had subjected them to some 12 years. I believe it is 12 years. Yes, verse 4. 12 years that they were subject to them. And then they rebelled again. And when they rebelled again, they went to war. The four allied kings and the five allied kings uh, from the Jordanian Valley. They went at one another. Meanwhile, it just picks up out of nowhere, basically, and says then that Abram was uh, living there in the oaks of Mamre and just like there enjoying peace and waiting for the promise of God. 
but it has, has him among the oak trees, and then here's all this war going on, and it's about to all come together. Now, how is it when Abram seems completely set apart from it that he becomes involved in the battle? Well, he gets word that they have captured his nephew Lot, who has settled in Sodom because he chose that area when he and his uncle Abram went their separate ways because they both accumulated so many possessions and so many flocks and herds that they had to separate them. Now, I want to pick up in Genesis 14, I'm going to pick up, let's see, I'm going to pick up at verse 10. So keep in mind that you've got this little, in this microcosm here, this little international squirmish. Can you keep that in your mind? Because it's going to become important. Because remember, through Abram, all nations will be blessed. So it already, what business does he have in it? Because he's going to have a lot of business in the things of the nations ultimately in a time through his line that he will never even see. So keeping that in mind, I want to pick up at verse 10 of Genesis 14, and it says, now you'll see in the verse before it, you'll see the four kings against five. Now the Sedim Valley contained many asphalt pits and as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them. So they fell into the asphalt pits, but the rest fled to the mountains. The four kings took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food and went on. They also took Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions, for he was living in Sodom, and they went on. One of the survivors came, I'm in verse 13, and told Abram the Hebrew, who lived near the oaks belonging to Mamre the Amorite, the brother of Eschol and the brother of Aner, they were bound by a treaty with Abram. Verse 14, when Abram heard that his relative had been taken prisoner, he assembled his 318 trained men born in his household, and they went in pursuit as far as Dan, verse 15, and he and his servants deployed against them by night, defeated them, pursued them as far as Hobah to the north of Damascus. He brought back all the goods and, all, and also his relative Lot and his goods as well as the women and the other people, verse 17. After Abram returned from defeating Chedorlaomer, the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom, who went out to meet him in the Shaveh Valley, that is in the king's valley, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest to God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Abram is blessed by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has handed over your enemies to you. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything, such a mysterious scene. And we don't have the time that we wish we could take to really delve into it and try to figure out some of the mystery behind it as much as we're able to. The book of Hebrews in the New Testament brings up this mysterious figure. Where he's so important here is that he comes in as a priest and king figure. He's the king of Salem, which it corresponds with Jerusalem. And he's bringing him, it says, he brings then out the bread and the wine. You can already see some of those priestly activities there, and you can see uh, some, just uh, the tie with the New Testament and that new covenant. He was a priest to God most high, and he blessed Abram and says, it is the God most high who has given you this victory. And Abram gives him a tithe. Now, verse 21, this gets really important. Then the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the people, but take the possessions for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand in an oath to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or sandal strap or anything that belongs to you so that you can never say I made Abram rich. I will take nothing except what the servants have eaten. But as for the share of these men who came with me, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre, they can take their share. After these events, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. In other words, Abram is saying to the king of Sodom, I have loyalty to one alone, and that is God most high. 
I will not be paid off. I will not be brought into an alliance with you because my one loyalty is to God most high. That is where I have raised my hand. That is where my oath is. I do not want anything from the kings of this world. So camp with me for just a moment until we look into why on earth he might be afraid. And, and let's look at the wording in Genesis 15 because what, what's the difference between the Lord said to Abram and the word of the Lord came to Abram? First time in all of Scripture it happens. God has spoken, God has spoken, God has spoken. Suddenly, the word of the Lord comes to Abram. Why? Why? Almost every single time you find it in Scripture, it is because there is a prophetic revelation virtually across the board. And you check me on that. There may be um, uh, a time or two that that's not true, but virtually across the board, it will be in, a, in the context of a prophetic revelation. And we know because later in the book of Genesis, Abram is actually called, by that time he's been renamed Abraham, and he is called a prophet, but he is being spoken to. This is coming. A prophetic word is coming to him. And the word of the Lord came to Abram. Do not be afraid. I am your shield. I am your exceeding reward. Now, we know there's a tie with Genesis chapter 14 in the reward because the king of Sodom tried to reward him. Listen, take all of this. Take all of this plunder. Now, this After they had run from the army that was opposing them, and they'd fallen into the asphalt pits, and he's going like, this is my stuff. You can have any of it you want. And he's going, you keep it. Just let, let me have these people. Let me have Lot. Let me have my family. You keep all your goods because... Whatever I have, whatever my provision is, it is not going to come from you. It is going to come from my faithful God. And so God is coming to him and saying, I, I am your reward. I am. As you trust in me, I will make sure. I will make sure that you are rewarded. And for us, this corresponds so perfectly to Hebrews 11, verse 6, so perfectly because it says, and so this is us now under the new covenant. Now without faith, it is impossible to please God since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. He rewards those who seek him. God is not afraid to be uh, attributed uh, as a rewarder. He tells us he is. He told him he was all the way from the very beginning. Now, what he's telling us is, you know, your reward may be here and it may be there. You may not say it in the, see it in this lifetime. But I will tell you this. I will reward your faithfulness to me, he says. I will reward it. So here's what I want to ask you, and this is where we'll camp for a little while. So, okay. Why would Abram be afraid? I read one commentary today, and I'll always think that a scholar knows better than I do, but it still sort of hit me strangely, as he said. He talked about the fear of the armies that had fled from the four kings, and he said, but Abram was not a man of fear. I, I, I believe that. I believe that. I, I do. I do. But I don't know how often God would waste breath to tell someone not to be afraid who wasn't afraid or wasn't about to be afraid or hadn't been afraid. I just don't know why would he waste that. When he says then to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, do not be afraid. Is it because Joshua was not afraid? I mean, he'd have to be. You don't tell someone not to be something when they're already not that. So somehow... There, there was a fear he was coming to undo. And I, I thought and thought, what, what would be some of those reasons? What are the possibilities? I thought one, I don't know if I can explain this well. I'm going to try to. But I wonder if Abram had looked back over that battle. Would you remember with me? He took his 318 trained men. Now, these trained men, I don't know that they've ever warred like this. So, you know, you have your training. They're mostly all shepherds. You know what I'm talking about. But it's like, 
let's have some, let's do some calisthenics. Let's do some push-ups. Let's get a hold of the oak trees and the limbs and let's, you know, pull up. And, and so he's trained these 318 men and he goes against these armies that could not be defeated by five kings and their armies. And he defeats them. But have you ever done something really, really brave and later thought, are you out of your mind? <laughs> Anybody ever had that come back on them? Like you did it at the time. I, I remember when I was in a wreck and it was on 610 at the Loop in Houston. And we literally went all, I wasn't driving the car, but I was right in the front seat in the passenger seat. And we literally went all the way 360 degrees, all the way around. And, I, and you talk about everything. I could see everything in, in absolute color. And it seemed like it took us forever for that car to spin all the way around before it hit the embankment and stopped. And I, mean, I wasn't even, I kept saying in the seconds that it could, it could only have taken seconds. But I kept saying over and over again, because one of my daughters was at the wheel, I kept saying to her, we're still okay. We're still okay. We're still okay. I have absolutely no fear through the whole thing. Afterwards, I nearly had a nervous breakdown. Anybody? Anybody? Because you think about it later and think, and sometimes you think when you've been through a furious battle, you fear going through it again. Say, for instance, you have fought cancer and fought valiantly and fought courageously. And you can look back on that and you know you did. You know you did. You know you, you stood steadfast in your faith. But the very thought, even though you knew you were victorious, am I speaking anybody's language in the house? Even though you knew you were victorious the last time you had the occasion to do it, somehow there's nothing scarier than having to do it again. So I wonder if that was it. Like, should I have taken some of those goods? You know, have you ever replayed later? Now, I'm not saying this is what I'm, I'm just saying scenarios, possible scenarios. Have you ever thought later, I wonder if I was rude? <laughs> because man, would, would it be dangerous to burn that bridge with that particular king, that particular person in power? Maybe I should have been nicer about it. Maybe I should have taken a little token from him. But I'd raise my hand in oath to the Lord. The people of God don't make deals for shields. The people of God don't make deals for shields. We have a shield. And he is the God most high. Our shield is the Lord himself. But, but maybe neither of those are correct. Maybe God is telling Abram not to be afraid, not because of what he has been through, but because of what he is about to go through. And not because it's going to be with an enemy, but because it is going to be with his God and it is going to want to scare him half to death. Anybody stepping in that with me? Remember when John, the apostle, who has literally leaned on the chest and shoulder of Jesus himself when the word was made flesh and dwelling among them, then sees him in the vision on the Isle of Patmos, and he drops as a dead man at his feet. And the Lord says, don't be afraid. I'm not sure I would have come to that on my own but it was this commentary excerpt that brought it to life for me. This one reason why teachers love to dig into commentaries for moments exactly like this. So here's what I'm suggesting to you. Maybe God is telling him not to fear the revelation he is about to receive. Now, this is Dr. V.P. Hamilton in his commentary on Genesis, and it says this. He says, this formula, and by formula, he means the formula of do not fear. And there are, of course, countless hundreds of times in the Word of God that God says that. 
to his people or to a person. This formula occurs frequently in the Old Testament on the lips of a prophetic spokesman when he encourages a group or an individual not to be intimidated by an enemy who is shortly to be encountered. Of whom need Abram be afraid? The juxtaposition of chapter 14 and chapter 15 suggests that it is not nearly as fearful to meet an antagonist on the battlefield as it is to encounter the deity in a vision. Abram may confront Shedeloamar, and that's that, that primary king, and live. But can he confront Yahweh and live? Remember when God said to Moses after Moses said, show me your glory. Show me your glory. And God said to him, you know, you, you cannot see my face and live. And I'm going to have to hide you in a cleft of the rock and cover you there with my hand until my glory passes by. Because you cannot see my face and live. And I thought, what a crazy, wild thought. That God is a shield to us against our enemy. He is even a shield to us against fatal sights of his own glory before we have immortal eyes that cannot die at the sight. Now, thankfully for us, God's promise to be shield was not just limited to Abram. It was not just limited to an individual. It became something that was given as a promise to the people of God under Moses, to all the Israelites. I love Deuteronomy 33, 29 that says this, How happy are you, Israel? Who is like you? A people saved by the Lord. He is the shield that protects you, the sword you boast in. He is the shield that protects you, the sword you boast in. I love references like this because it is no accident. Then we get to places where where it talks in the rest of Scripture about the shield and the sword. These two pieces of weaponry. One defensive, the most important defensive weapon uh, that was given to the warrior. And the other, the sword, the only offensive weapon that was given to the ancient warrior. So, since he brings it to Moses and all the Israelites, he's not only a shield within the Abrahamic and Mosaic covenants, but over and over again in the narrative of David and then through the Psalms, the Psalms of David and then the Psalms of other psalmists, he makes the same promise. I'm going to read you just a smattering of occasions. There are many, many, but just a a few of the occasions in the Psalms when he talks about being a shield for us. Psalm 3.3 is probably my favorite of all. It says, but you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I, I just can't think of a time when we could use our heads to be lifted more than right now. I'm talking about collectively. Perhaps we've had other times individually, but I'm talking about collectively to have the lifter of our head, our shield, the glory about us. Repeatedly in Psalm 18, and it's coming out of where he said it in the narrative in 2 Samuel chapter 22, so it's almost identical in Psalm 18, verse 2 says this, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock where I seek refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. You know, David is called the man after God's own heart. God himself calls him that. And so it gives us insight into the fact that God loves it when we see him, God, as ours. And you look at David's life and you think, thank goodness David shared. Because honestly, my God, my refuge, my fortress, my strength. See, that's coming into true relationship with God when you realize he's not just like the whole corporate body. Their shield, the fortress of the church, the defender, the keeper, but he is yours. He is yours. And I'm going to tell you something So often, we will not ever come to the conclusion, to the marrow of our bones, 
that he is our fortress, our deliverer, our shield until nobody else can be. We have to come to times in our lives when we're willing to forget the person or forgive the person, not forget them. Forgive the person that could not be God for us, that could not shield us completely, that could not always defend us, that could not come through for us. But if at the end of that you discovered who could, that was not wasted. In Psalm 18, over and over again, it would say it again in 30, God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is pure. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. 35, you have given me the shield of your salvation. Your right hand upholds me and your humility exalts me. Then Psalm 28, 7, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart celebrates and I give thanks to him with my song. Okay, I'm just dying for you to turn with me to Psalm 91. Psalm 91. Now, so who wrote this psalm? We, we don't know for certain. Uh, in the Hebrew, uh, it is not attributed to an author, but Hebrew tradition attributes it to Moses. You think, well, that, that is, that's, that's wild. Why in the world would it be? Well, notice with me when book four of the Psalms begins in Psalm 90. If you look at the heading on Psalm 90, you will see that Psalm 90 is a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Now, the Septuagint, the Greek Septuagint, attributes Psalm 91 to David. So which is it? Well, we don't know for certain. But it, it could be and, all, and, and probably is that Moses originally penned it and then David takes it and puts it. He, under the inspiration of God, puts it down um, on the page in what would become the uh, sacred songbook of our, uh, our holy writ, the word of God, the scriptures. So Psalm 91 and a very significant occasion where God is described as a shield, I want to read verses 1 through 4. The one who lives under the protection of the Most High dwells in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say concerning the Lord who is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, he himself will rescue you from the bird trap, from the destructive plague. He will cover you with his feathers. You will take refuge under his wings. His faithfulness will be a protective shield. His faithfulness will be your protective shield. Please listen very, very carefully to this because it is so easy for us to get confused. Not your faith in your faith. Our faith in our faith will not be a shield for us. That we're just going to like... I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to even let myself have a second thought. I'm not even going to think about another scenario. I'm, I'm going to believe this. If it kills me, I'm going to believe this. I'm not going to let myself for one second doubt this. This is the way it's going to go down. I will believe this and I will not veer to my right or my left. This is what I believe. That is faith in our faith and it will not be our shield. It will not be our shield. Your shield is not your faith in a desired outcome. It's not. In fact, that can really mess with us. Because if we put, if we think our faith that it's going to shield us by us thinking we're going to get what we ask for and the outcome that we're looking for, that that's going to be our shield, what happens if for some reason, known only to the sovereign mind of God, and one day known to us when we come into full knowledge and we, are known, we know as we've been known, what if it doesn't happen? Faith was not your shield. Faith was not my shield because my faith was in the desired outcome. Your shield is not going to be your faith in getting what you asked. Mine's not going to be my faith in getting what I asked. Our faith, listen carefully, our faith is not going to be a shield by way of faith in a prophetic word that we were absolutely certain we received. In other words, somebody speaks a word over us, so we're going to have faith that that word is going to come to pass. That is faith in a prophetic word that is spoken by man that is altogether different by, than God and his word. 
And that's not what he says will be our shield. You talk about something that can mess us up. Like I feel like there are some things, I mean, this is legitimate. We, we see this, that we can just sense in prayer. I mean, over a length of time, not just in a one little flash of a moment that we just decide, I, I really believe God put this word on me. I really believe that this is something he told me to count on. I mean, that, that can be legit. I've recorded that kind of thing in the word. I've seen some of it come to pass. But that's not going to be a shield for me. That I'm going to think every single time, well, I, I really believe that God promised me this about my children. So, okay, what if it doesn't come to pass? That's no shield. That shield just dropped to the ground, and those fiery arrows just went right through my chest. Right through my heart. And singed it and burned its way in. Faith is a shield when our faith is in God's faithfulness. Listen, listen, listen. When faith is a shield for us and can extinguish every flaming dart of the evil one, it will be a faith that trusts in his faithfulness. You know what will save you over and over again? What will put out every, listen, listen, every one of them. Is it every one of them in all circumstances? Take up the shield of faith which, with, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil. Every single last one of them. What kind of faith is that? Trust that my God is faithful. That no matter what is to come, no matter what is to come, my God is faithful. Listen, God as shield, even though he said, Abram, I am your shield. Said to Moses and the Israelites, I am your shield. Said to David and the psalmist and then to the congregation that sang it, I am your shield. It was never understood by Abram, Moses, or David or under any of their covenants that what God indicated to them was that they would never have difficulty, that they would never be challenged in their faith. Faith is believing in something we cannot see. I mean, if we're just like, I mean, there it is. That's not faith. So it was already inherent in the, in the whole process, in the whole journey. But I can tell you something. Because we can look at a psalm like this and we can think, okay, I need to memorize this, especially because of what we've gone through with the pandemic. I, I want to know how a plague will not hit my house. I mean, don't you? I mean, listen, if, if, if it would have been appropriate to put blood on our doorposts, wouldn't we have done it? Just ever looking for a formula, what would be the thing what would be the thing we could do, the thing we could say, the thing we could believe that would always assure us that no danger would come our way? Man, wouldn't we be thinking of it? He who dwells in the shadow of the Almighty. The formation is get behind God and he is ever before you. And when he is ever before you and you are a follower of Jesus and not trying to lead Jesus where you want him to go. When I am a follower of Jesus, I'm in behind him. And that means everywhere he leads me, he first goes. And I will dwell in the shadow. That I do not want the limelight. I, I want the shadow to come over me. You want the shadow to come over you because that is your shield to get in behind Jesus and go, I want to go where you're going. I don't want to go anywhere but where you're going. I don't know. I, I'm probably so wrong about this. I've been wrong about so many things. But every now and then, I mean, it's the strangest thing. That for so long, we just had to quit going to church. Sometimes you think, did he send us all home? And go, you know what? I'm so sick of performance. I could spew you out of my mouth. You're using me as your backdrop so that you can perform. And I'm tired of it. I'm refining my church. And I will refine her. 
through fires that purify. So knowing and choosing to believe God is absolutely and always faithful is our shield then in sickness and in health, in thriving and barely surviving, in winning and in losing, in warring and in resting, in living and in dying. Imagine just trusting God enough to die when the time comes in peace. My God's faithful. I'm going to shut my eyes here. I'm going to open them there. I'm going to see my God. And then there's life forevermore. Imagine, imagine the shield that would be. Our shield in singing and in sighing. And, and listen carefully to this. In times of seeming immunity, and vulnerability. Every now and then we can go through something, maybe an event or a season, that for whatever reason, we almost feel immune to the enemy's attack. It's just like, I've had one. I've had one. That it was just like, I can't even explain what it was like. Just times of immunity, and then there are times of just complete vulnerability. Now, I can't think uh, of a time, I've lived over six decades, that we have ever been more vulnerable collectively and globally than we are right now and that we have been in these past months. See, there's just nothing like believing that God is your shield when you feel completely vulnerable. See, that's what a shield is for. You see, a shield is strategy. Strategy. What you want when you're in warfare is for Jesus to be in between you and your enemy. This is why it is such a mistake for us to be out in front of him, performing, when he's going, you know, actually, your safety was like back there. I called you to be a follower. Follower, that means... <laughs> because that's your safety. I go before you. With my husband, and I do this with my children, immediately if there's any kind of danger, and I'm beside my husband, he will put his right arm, it just goes out like this, and I'm swept behind him. And I mean, two seconds, I'm swept behind him. Both of my girls have outgrown me. They're both a couple of inches taller than I am. And in one second flat, if I perceive any danger whatsoever, I can have them behind me like, whoa. Get behind your mother. Get behind your mother. Our go-between. Faith that the unseen, that's what I want you to hear, and I think about this all the time. It's one of the most important principles I know, that what you cannot see is a greater reality than what you can see. We think that where we're going is kind of going to be like, like vaporous and like ghost-like. We're just going to like walk in, in, into one another and walk past one another. We'll just be like ghosts, like apparitions. That's not true. This is the shadow. That will be substance. Johnny Erickson taught us it, it this way. It would be the difference between being in the womb and then born out into the earth. That's what it would be like to be in heaven when I mean, not this is it. Now, this is color. Everything else was just black and white. Yeah. This is real. Everything else now seems like a dream. Yeah. How has God assured us of his faithfulness? And I do mean how exactly, how exactly has he authoritatively, according to Scripture, 
I hate to have to admit this, but only recently have I learned because my daughter Melissa taught me. I was trying to figure out what some words to a particular worship song that I love, what the words were. And she said, Mother, there's a feature. If you'll bring up your phone and go to your iTunes and you're listening to the music, you just tap this little button right here and it'll play the words. Just like it's playing the music, it's giving you the words. I said, like karaoke. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, it blew, just blew my mind. And so I've just been obsessed with it ever since. So while I'm getting ready in the morning, while I'm putting on my mascara, I've got my worship music playing and I see the words for the first time. And I'm like, that's what it was saying? You cannot believe what different things I've been singing. That's what it was saying? I've been singing all of this all this time. Are you telling me that is what that song was saying? And I'll just think, it was so much better than what I was saying. Occasionally I might think, you know what, I liked better what I was saying. But no, usually it was so much better than what I was playing. I don't care what you've heard from others, from me from pastors, teachers, leaders, mentors, worship leaders. I'm asking you today, what does Scripture say? Not what do you keep hearing, because you may be getting the words wrong. No, what are the words on the page? Because there's nothing, nothing like Scripture. So what here? And the God-breathed words of Scripture, does he say about his faithfulness? Psalm 119, 114 in the ESV reads this way. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. In your word. My husband some years ago, it's been many, many years since this happened, but I still think about it so often. I think about it many, many times when I'm on a walk and I see something so beautiful that I don't want to forget. It was years ago that I was uh, with him and we saw just the most incredible sight. I mean, so I said, where, where, this is way before we had phones on our, our, our cameras on our phones. I think we had, we had phones at that time uh, that we, that were, um, that, you know, we could put in our back pocket, but we couldn't take pictures with them. And I just said, where's a camera when we need it? And he says, Elizabeth, this is one of the things I love best, best about Keith, is that he says stuff just like this. He says, Elizabeth, I'll tell you what I do. When I don't have a way to capture the moment, but I want to remember it forever, I look at it real hard like this, and then I go. <laughs> he said, I take a picture of it in my mind. And he said, and I can think back over it over and over again. When you see God's faithfulness and you see it actually revealed, I mean, you can, it's right there before you. I mean, you, you saw it manifested. You saw that he was your shield. You saw how he was faithful to you. When you see it out there experientially, oh, I mean, blink and take a picture of it. I mean, remember it forever. Rehearse it. Tell it back to him. But that is not the same as scripture, Robin. Yeah. Our experiences are one thing. And they're wonderful Blink those eyes. Remember what God did forever. But should a season come when there is nothing for your eyes to see out in the realm of your experience, is God less faithful? We have to go to his word. We have to go to his word. And what are some things God's word says about his faithfulness? And I'm going to tell you a few things. God is light, and in him there is no darkness. God is love, and his steadfast love endures forever, and his perfect love drives out all fear. The Lord knows those who are his, and he calls you by name. He is with you and will never leave you or forsake you. If you are in Christ, his very spirit dwells within you as a guarantee of your future inheritance. That is Ephesians chapter one. He is both your provider and your provision. He is both your rewarder and your reward. God himself, Psalm 16 says, is your portion, your cup of blessing, and he holds your future. The Lord watches over you. That's Psalm 121. He sees who wrongs you. God cannot lie. He cannot sin against you, nor can he entice you to sin. He is holy, 
and no unholiness will ever be discovered in him. Christ bore all of your transgressions on the cross. The Lord's mercies new every single morning. God is good and only good. And his nearness, according to Psalm 73, 28, his nearness is your good. Furthermore, he will ultimately work everything, including every evil thing that was intended to harm you. He will work everything for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. The throne of the Lord is firmly established and all authority belongs to him. You have bold access to that throne to find grace and mercy to help you in your time of need. God hears you when you pray. That you can always know. He cares for you. He binds up your broken heart and he collects your tears in a bottle. He will perfect that which concerns you and he will finish what he started. God has no rival. He cannot be defeated. His plans cannot be thwarted. The Lord is your keeper. He is keeping you. He will always keep you. And you are not up for grabs, nor is your fate in jeopardy. Does someone just need to know that he is keeping you? Have you ever been afraid of just being tossed aside? Anybody need to know? He is not going to divorce you. He's not going to turn his back on you. Your future is not in jeopardy if you are in him. God is eternal, and if you are in Christ, you will live eternally in his presence. And what he has waiting for you who love him is more than your eyes have ever seen, your ears have ever heard, and your mind has ever conceived. Those are just a few things. Perhaps you've heard it before, but I don't think, no matter how many times I've heard it, that I would ever get tired of hearing it. I want to remind you that God's faithfulness, so I want you to picture with me, that it says it can put out every single, the shield of faith can put out every single dart, fiery dart of the enemy. So here's what happens. All sorts of things start happening. Man, we can feel the thud of those flaming darts on our shield just inches from our faces. We can feel the hit and we can feel the heat. But in all of it, we continue to say, my God is faithful. My God is gracious and good. My God is holy. There is no evil in him. My God cannot lie to me. He absolutely cannot lie to me. And he will never let me go. He is my keeper. When I close my eyes on this earth, I will open my eyes and I will see the face of my God. These are the kinds of things. This is where faith is your shield. Faith is my shield. God's faithfulness is not just our security, it's our strategy. Because listen, those who are bereft of faith will be buried in fear. You just will be. To know to put everything in him, everything, risk it all, just him. This is my God. I have lifted my hand to him alone. And he will be faithful. He'll be faithful. You want to know something about those ancient shields? They have the capacity that when that warrior would come alongside other warriors, Not only to be the one shield over the one warrior, but next to one another to become a wall. And when those warriors would come together against their enemy, whereas the shield had always been a defensive weapon, suddenly, when linked to the other shields of other warriors beside it, and all those warriors side by side, moving forward together, all of a sudden, it is not just a defensive weapon. It is moving forward in a wall that pushes the enemy back. I ask you in these days when we are so cut off from one another, do you have some fellow warriors of the faith who battle with you? Are you engaged in a local church where you know there are people that 
when your faith is weak, you've got other people beside you that can help you hold up your shield. And, and then perhaps you'll be weak and they can help you. They can link their shield to yours and help you keep moving forward. They can whisper next to you, keep going, keep going. Our God is faithful. Our God is faithful. Our God is faithful. He will not let us go. He will not let us down. We're a wall next to one another. A wall. You have the capacity with your fellow warriors to walk so steadfastly next to one another that you can push back darkness. Girlfriend, that's some power.